Well, now the floor is yours, Mr. Kaisuka. So ladies and gentlemen, please welcome him with a big round of applause. Thank you, Master of the Ceremony, for the kind introduction. Uh, uh, let me correct the, uh, just one thing. I'm no longer the uh, Deputy Commissioner of the Tax uh, oh, Apologies. Tax Agency. Because <laughs> uh, my, my, my paper is wrong. Oh, OK. I, so, I got the biography. So, so anyway, don't worry. <laughs> I'm not here to, to tax you. <laughs> so anyway, uh, we are happy to be at uh, the uh, last session today. Uh, I think the, uh, most of you are exhausted with the, uh, the, the long and the substantive discussion already. Uh, my uh, role here is to, to, to have the uh, efficient discussion and the interesting discussion, uh, to, uh, for, uh, especially for those of who are struggling with the jet lag uh, after the uh, long travel from uh, Washington, D.C. So I should, uh, the uh, discussion should be an uh, eye-opener. Okay, so uh, the uh, previous session uh, focused on the uh, mature economy, uh, the country case of Japan and Korea. Uh, this session will then turn to the uh, uh, turn its focus on on to the uh, set of the emerging uh, dynamic country cases, uh, including China, India, and Indonesia. It's a very fascinating set of the countries. Uh, they have uh, many things in, in, in common uh, in challenges, uh, but the, uh, the, uh, the measures to counter the, uh, those uh, common challenges is different from uh, a country to, to another. And also there are some country specificity of the, the uh, challenges. Uh, the, uh, these three countries uh, commonly uh, enjoy the, the uh, uh, relatively strong uh, uh, growth since the uh, financial, uh, global financial crisis. Uh, but the recently the pace of growth has been uh, somewhat reduced. Uh, key question here uh, is, is this a temporary phenomenon or more permanent or fundamental in nature? In other words, uh, are there any risk of the uh, middle income trap for these countries? Uh, uh, if so, uh, what are the measures to avoid uh, those kind of risk? Uh, the, uh, in the morning session, uh, there was uh, three underlying the uh, key uh, challenges to the Asian economy, uh, which are the, the uh, uh, main discussion issue for this uh, uh, conference. Uh, the first, uh, demographic changes. And uh, we learn uh, in the morning, uh, the, the, uh, in the panel session uh, one, uh, the, the, uh, there are a uh, wide range of the countries, uh, age, uh, the uh, old countries and the, the uh, younger countries, and uh, their, their impact of aging is uh, different from, for, for old countries and the younger countries. Here we have the uh, China may belong to the uh, old country, and the India, Indonesia is belonging to the young country. So uh, it may be uh, interesting to, to see the difference. And then the low productivity and other challenges. And there are certain uh, policies set uh, for, uh, to tackle with the uh, low productivity, maybe deregulation, access to the finance, or uh, the, uh, uh, the accumulating the human resources. And the, uh, uh, we are going to, to touch upon if, if, it, if there is uh, some, some, some cases. And uh, the last three, the spillover from uh, low growth in the advanced economy. Uh, that is going to be through the uh, trade channel and the ca capital uh, flow, or financial flow channels. So uh, the, the, um, uh, we are going to, to have the uh, many things to, to discuss. Uh, then let me introduce the, uh, our, our, the, the uh, presenter and the discussant. The, uh, first, for the uh, uh, China discussion, I'm happy to introduce um, Mr. Jim Ma. Uh, Dr. Ma uh, is a chief economist at the uh, People's Bank of China uh, Research Bureau and also chairman of the Green Finance Committee of China, Society of Finance and Banking, and co-chair of the G20 uh, Green Finance Study Group. And uh, we have a discussant, uh, Mr. Alfred Schipke, uh, who is the uh, IMF senior re uh, resident representative for China. I think he is getting in the fifth years already. So he's uh, one of the, uh, definitely one of the uh, most knowledgeable person about the Chinese economy in the fund, I may say so. And then uh, turning to the uh, India, uh, I, we have the uh, uh, Ms. Uh, uh, Prachi Mishra. And uh, Dr. Uh, Mishra is a deputy division chief in the Western Hemisphere Department at the IMF. Uh, that's very interesting to have the, somebody uh, from the Western Hemisphere to discuss India. Uh, but uh, anyway, uh, the, uh, prior to that, she was the, the, uh, at the Reserve Bank of India. 
And then we have a discussant, uh, Ken, uh, Mr. Ken Kang, uh, who is the uh, deputy director in the Asian Pacific Department of the International Monetary Fund. And he engaging the, the uh, uh, Indian uh, negotiation of Article 4, if I correctly understand. Uh, uh, very recently, and he uh, faced up the uh, demonetization uh, the, the problem in India when he was uh, in the country. And then for the Indonesia, uh, we have uh, the uh, uh, speaker, uh, Mitali Das. Uh, Ms. Mitali uh, Das, a deputy division chief in the strategy department of the IMF, and she is fully engaged in the external balance assessment. And the, uh, for the discussant for the Indonesia, uh, we have a uh, Dr. Muhammad Shatib uh, Basuri, uh, uh, who is Indonesian former Minister of Finance, and uh, now currently is the Chairman of the Advisory Board of the uh, Mandini Institute and the Chairman of the Indonesian Infrastructure Finance. So uh, we have a very eminent set of the, uh, uh, the uh, uh, presenter and discussant. Um, the uh, only one housekeeping uh, the uh, thing is uh, uh, we have to, to manage our time uh, very efficiently. There is a panel uh, in front of us uh, which suggests the uh, uh, remaining time, five minutes and one minute. And the, uh, uh, if you are standing on the podium, make a presentation, I think uh, you uh, miss to, to look at the uh, remaining time. So I will the, the, uh, ring the bell uh, if there is uh, only one minute left. So. Uh, uh, then uh, let's uh, start the, uh, our discussion uh, first uh, on China. Uh, Mr. Ma, please. Thank you very much, Mr. Kazuka, and good afternoon, everyone. I like to spend uh, probably only 15 minutes running through a um, couple of uh, facts on the deceleration of the Chinese economy and uh, then focus on a model exercise uh, which analyzes the reasons for the deceleration and predicting, hopefully, um, the next few decades, um, more specifically next 18 years, uh, deceleration and uh, uh, specify the underlying reasons uh, for the deceleration. Now here is the uh, chart for the last uh, 15 years. Uh, clearly you can see we started off with GDP growth of like 10, 12 percent around 2003 and now it's about six point something. And uh, uh, this is quite remarkable. Uh, a lot of people back three, four years ago, uh, they couldn't accept uh, this deceleration and they kept talking about uh, China can continue to grow at 8 percent, over 8 percent for another 30 years. Uh, but these people are no longer talking anymore uh, after the last three, four years of uh, reality. <coughs> and uh, since we are with the central bank, uh, we certainly look at CPI and other inflation measures as well. It doesn't change too much. Um, excluding all these volatilities, um, we stayed around 3% and remain <coughs> uh, to be the, uh, at that level. Uh, obviously, as everybody discussed today, uh, the fundamental, probably the biggest fundamental driver for the growth deceleration is labor. Um, by labor, we mean the uh, working age population in China is defined as uh, this group uh, from age 16 to uh, 60. And uh, we used uh, uh, both historical data um, <clears throat> from long time ago to now, as well as a forecast model, which we did by ourselves on demographics. Um, from that, you can see <coughs> Hopefully this is a laser. The labor force has peaked um, in 2011. Before that, it was a growth every year for many, many decades. And uh, starting from 2011, it began to decline. Um, last few years, the labor force contracted about, about three to four million people per year. Uh, so I often say this is equivalent to the size of Singapore. Uh, we're losing a Singapore every year. And uh, in the future, uh, this uh, deceleration is gonna actually accelerate, um, looking at uh, the year-on-year -year change of the labor force. It's now about minus 0.5, which means that uh, uh, the labor force goes down by 0.5% per year. And uh, <clears throat> sometime later, it's gonna be 1%, and uh, by 2050, it may contract by 1.5 to 2% per year, which essentially means that this deceleration uh, is gonna 
accelerate and its impact is downward pressure on the uh, growth uh, will also get bigger. Now, this is very abstract, but I clearly feel the pressure um, on myself. Just a few months ago, both my parents were sick. Um, they are in Shanghai, and I had to fly to uh, Shanghai three times within a month uh, to see them in different hospitals. And uh, <clears throat> the same thing happens to my parents-in-law in Beijing. Uh, even though myself and my wife are <clears throat> not a single kids, but already uh, a lot of pressure, a lot of uh, impact on the productivity that we have. And the whole country are experiencing this uh, uh, in an unnatural way because uh, the Chinese deceleration of labor force was triggered by the uh, one-child policy in the <coughs> 1970s. Uh, that's why uh, the fertility rate, or what we call total fertility rate, went down from three uh, in the pre-1970 period, suddenly <coughs> to 1.5 uh, in the following few decades. This uh, reduction of fertility rate by 1.5 typically takes 100 years uh, in other countries if it took about 20 years uh, in China. And uh, very quickly, it's going to translate into <coughs> the reduction of labor force and also uh, the higher proportion of the uh, old age population within the economy. Now, <coughs> what we try to do here is uh, uh, discuss both this factor, uh, which is the most important structural factor, on the Chinese future growth, as well as many others, uh, which you guys have not uh, really focused on, but I think also important. So demographics will be done in, in our model. Um, it's a DSG model. And I'm also looking at uh, the environmental cost, uh, which nobody mentioned, but we think is extremely important in China. Uh, that's why in my title, uh, uh, that's red, there's a lot of green stuff. Uh, I've been the chairman of the Green Finance Committee and the head of the uh, G20 uh, Green Finance Study Group, and so on and so forth the last three years. Um, in this aspect, uh, I'll just give you a couple of anecdotes. Um, back uh, four years ago, when I started off in Beijing, um, the uh, air pollution level, uh, what we call PM2.5, was 90. And the safe level defined by WHO for developed countries 10. So it's nine times higher than the safe level for developed countries. And 75% of the water sources are contaminated in China, and 19% of arable land is contaminated, which essentially means that 20% uh, of the food that you eat randomly on the street may be unsafe. So that's a massive uh, potential cost to the economy, which has not been taken into account in the past few decades, and will be reflecting the costs in the coming few decades. Um, <clears throat> I, I think OECD countries have gone through this stage, um, but uh, countries like India, Indonesia have not begun to really look seriously at this thing. Um, it may not be in your model. Today, I think it will be in your model uh, for growth potential in five to ten years' time. <clears throat> um, there are a couple of other things I will, will talk about as well, uh, especially the transition from a uh, um, manufacturing-based economy towards a service-based economy. It also has an impact on the <clears throat> growth potential. Now, finally, uh, the point is on the monetary perspective, uh, because we are, with the central bank, we have to think, why do I need to analyze uh, um, real you know, growth potential? One linkage is that uh, uh, in China, at least for now, the uh, monetary target, which is M2 growth, annually is set based on nominal GDP growth target. And nominal GDP is uh, inflation plus real growth. If real growth is overestimated, then nominal GDP is overestimated then M2 is overestimated, then you have too much monetary expansion, which leads to a lot of leveraging. That's been a problem for, for, for the past many years. And uh, a realistic estimate of future growth potential uh, can help avoid that problem, uh, excessive monetary expansion and excessive leveraging. Now, uh, we compare many different methodologies for quantifying the uh, structural factors in impact on growth, including various econometric models and so on, but we thought uh, the DSG is probably a more appropriate one because it does take into account some of the, uh, the micro foundations and also interaction between supply, demand, different sectors, and so on. So <clears throat> we use that approach. Um, we looked at uh, four um, structural factors and their impact on growth potential uh, for the next 18 years. One is a decline in labor supply. Uh, which we estimate using a separate model um, based on our fertility uh, <coughs> rate, death rate, and all these assumptions. And secondly, it's environmental cost. So we need to make assumption on <coughs> how much uh, 
the past environmental <coughs> um, degradation would cost the future uh, in terms of uh, growth. And here I use a specific example of clean energy because if you want to clean the air, you need to swift, uh, switch from coal burning to cleaner energy. Uh, for example, natural gas is an intermediate step, and uh, then you need to move to some renewables such as solar and wind and other things. On average, uh, natural gas is 30% more expensive than <coughs> coal-fired power. Uh, so that's sort of assumption we put in uh, if you want to move towards a cleaner uh, 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 environment, and then additional 30% costs for energy uh, will be implied. And uh, the third structural factor is called consumer preference um, <coughs> change from goods to services. If you look at the most of these uh, manufacturing goods, uh, their consumption in Chinese households are pretty much uh, saturated. Um, <coughs> you know, the uh, Chinese uh, citizens, uh, urban citizens average have a uh, living space of 35 square meters. That's very high. In fact, in Hong Kong, it's only 14, where I stay for more than a decade. Uh, it's, uh, it's more than twice of the Hong Kong uh, space. And uh, uh, in most of the, the big cities, I think the cars are just too many. The five million cars in Beijing and so on and so forth. Uh, <clears throat> you know, traffic jam is so much. So all these physical goods, I think, are a lot <clears throat> already. And very naturally, the consumption of physical goods will gradually slow down and the services will pick up. Um, just give you an example of the magnitudes of a potential service pickup. Currently, the healthcare uh, expenditure in China is only 6% of GDP. In the U.S., it's 18%. So it can be uh, increased by another twofold. And uh, education-wise, uh, one example is China sending uh, half a million students to the U.S. every year. Uh, what if we can do the same quality uh, education domestically? Uh, you know the U.S. education is five times more expensive than in China. Uh, so these are the uh, sort of uh, examples of how strong this uh, shift would be. But this shift is costly to growth uh, because uh, at least for now, given the current uh, technologies, uh, services are very labor intensive and productivity growth is very slow relative to the manufacturing sector. Um, in the past few decades, our manufacturing sector used to have a 10% growth in labor productivity every year for a few decades. But uh, in service sector, the typical ones like uh, the barber shop, there's no growth in productivity. 100 years ago, uh, this barber shop, it takes one hour to cut your hair and now it takes one hour to cut your hair. <clears throat> Zero forever. So that sort of a shift is gonna lead to slowdown in total factor productivity growth. And this, uh, this shift is so strong. Finally, uh, we need to look at something positive which may potentially boost our growth potential. And uh, here's one I think uh, uh, may offer the biggest potential that's called uh, the declining share of SOEs in the GDP. Um, now, SOEs been declining in GDP for the past few decades. In 1978, uh, that was my estimate, the SOEs accounted for 70% of GDP. Now it's 30%. So it's almost like, uh, you know, um, like uh, almost like 1% per year, uh, that kind of stuff. And in the future, I think we'll continue to decline. And that has a benefit to the economy because SOEs are 40% lower in terms of total factor productivity compared with private uh, companies. So the declining share by reforming the SOEs, partial privatization, making them listed companies, and so on and so forth, could potentially boost <coughs> uh, efficiency. So let's combine all the four in the model and do some forecast. Now these are the literature reviews I will skip. And uh, here is the uh, uh, sort of a very typical DSG model, uh, which we modify a little bit by putting two different sectors, SOEs versus non-SOEs. We have a monetary authority there, which follows a, 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 a sort of a tailor type of rule. And uh, <coughs> uh, we use a, a production function, which we can shock the uh, TFP. Um, and uh, uh, we have a link with this uh, demographic model. Uh, so the labor supply is coming you know, externally um, from the, uh, the demographic model. So here are the few results on the simulation of the impact of a structural factor <coughs> on future growth. The labor factor has the largest shock, negative shock, to future growth potential. Uh, annually, based on our demographic forecast, <coughs> it shocks GDP 
I think roughly by 0 0.8, 0 0.9 percentage points. Um, and it may go higher by 2050, which is not in the model yet. Uh, it could be as, as big as uh, you know, 1.5 or something. Um, and cumulatively, it would take off a lot of a GDP. <laughs> the second cost which we put in uh, is this environmental cost. Um, <clears throat> our assumption is that uh, currently the clean energy is only 14% of the total energy, and uh, we need to increase it. Uh, the government promise is not that much. I think uh, maybe around 40% by 2035. Um, but we make it more aggressive as uh, in the past few years we considering outperformed the government uh, announcements. So by doing this shift and also assuming that uh, the energy, clean energy costs 30% higher than the dirty energy, then <clears throat> uh, you got this cost impact on GDP, um, which varies um, in you know, different years, but somewhere between you know, 0 0.4 to 0.6%, 0 0.8, 0 0.9% on an annual basis. <clears throat> And uh, the shift um, from goods to services, uh, we have not figured out a, uh, the best way to do this, but uh, just as a proxy, um, <clears throat> when you shift from a manufacturing-based economy to a service-based economy, the labor intensity goes up, um, as all these guys need to work uh, you know, in hospitals servicing, for example, the elderly. Just to give you one example, in our estimated, <clears throat> uh, we need 20 million more people to serve the elderly uh, in nursing home in the coming few decades. Uh, that's a lot of labor intensity. Of course, if someone tell me they can be done by robots, that's a different story. But assuming the current technology, uh, <clears throat> service is gonna be very labor intensive, and the labor share, which is sort of the labor elasticity in the um, production function, uh, should go up. Currently, that share is only 50% in China, but we know that in the US is about you know, close to 70%, um, reflecting a uh, more of a service-oriented <clears throat> economy. Now, given this set of assumptions, um, we will also estimate the impact uh, on GDP uh, because the uh, uh, underlying uh, reason uh, is that uh, the service sector is less productive uh, in terms of gross productivity. Last thing is about the <coughs> SOE becoming non-SOEs. Assuming that uh, currently 70, we move to 80 uh, by 2035 and uh, uh, productivity, you know, growth um, reached, productivity level reached the private sector uh, level, and therefore it has a positive impact on annual GDP growth, something like 0.3, 0.4 percentage points every year. Uh, so essentially what we did is consolidate everything. You know, the three good things, and the, uh, three bad things, and one good things, and put them into one model, see what happens. <clears throat> Uh, they're a little bit of offsetting uh, to each other once you consolidate everything because they interact in the general equivalent sense. So uh, the final numbers may be slightly different from the uh, sort of a single factor simulation. Uh, but broadly, uh, they, are, they are quite consistent with a simple uh, sort of a summation approach. Now here are the few conclusions. We try to uh, quantify the impact of the key structural change, which we believe are keys um, to uh, long-term growth potential and inflation using DSG model. Um, the reason for quantification is that uh, really policy makers at a very high level, they need to get a sense. They need to be realistic on how big this shock is to growth uh, coming from structural factors. And uh, we took um, labor force, environmental cost, uh, consumer preference shift into account. And these three things combined, they knock off growth potential by about 1.9 percentage points. <clears throat> Um, on an annual basis in the coming 18 years. But if we do the reform on the SOE side, it may lift gross potential by 0.3 percentage points. Um, so we are getting a net 1.6 percentage point decline in the, uh, economic growth uh, in the coming eight years. Then we have to assume what's the current potential. Let's say it's 6.6, .6, which is slightly lower than the last couple of quarters number. Uh, I have specific reasons why it should be 6.6 .6 rather than 6.9. Uh, <clears throat> then we knock off 1.6, it becomes 5. 5 uh, is likely to be the gross potential in 18 years' time based on this model. Okay. Um, <clears throat> Inflation-wise, uh, uh, as a structure in the model, it's not really been uh, a problem. Um, it's not so much affected by these structural factors. Finally, just a few caveats on the... Uh, uh, the methodologies and the potential sort of missing variables that need to be discussed. Um, I think overall we might uh, 
underestimated, I'm right on time, <coughs> uh, the structural factors impact on, negative impact on, on growth um, because uh, uh, we're actually missing other environmental aspects. We only talk about clean energy, which helps on the air quality, but we have not talked about the water and land. And land contamination has a few times higher cost than the air. Um, <clears throat> now the other thing which is missing, but maybe on the positive side, is, uh, is uh, technology innovation. Uh, China has launched a very aggressive innovation program by putting incentives uh, for R&D and so on and so forth. Um, if the Korean experience back a decade ago uh, could be applied to China, that's better, but the last few years experience seems to be less encouraging as was shown this morning. Productivity growth may not come out of R&D uh, spending. So that's another uncertain part, but maybe upside, uh, which I'm missing here. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Mao. I think it's very challenging to, to summarize the, uh, your structure of the uh, reform agenda in a 20 minutes time, but uh, you, you did uh, the excellent job. Thank you. Uh, then the, uh, uh, Mr. Alfred, could you make uh, some comment on the, your presentation? So, Alfred. Thank you very much. <clears throat> it's a real pleasure to be here to talk about uh, a topic I think that is on everybody's mind, but in particular in, um, in, in China. Um, I will be very brief. Um, just a few comments, uh, just set the context, two or three words about the models, some potential caveats, and then one or two words about uh, policies or the political economy uh, of all of this. So, I think um, uh, truly the question that uh, is on everybody's mind in, in China, as um, uh, Majun was uh, suggesting, is, is China going to fall into the middle income trap? Uh, that would be um, uh, not unexpected since there are quite a number of uh, countries that um, have had a problem to get out of it. Um, and interestingly, that the uh, uh, empirical evidence that we have isn't really helpful either, depending on whether you're looking at the whole world and you run a panel and you think about some growth convergence with those countries, or you think Asia is very different, uh, and then of course you come up with a very different um, um, uh, growth convergence. So, um, past information is maybe limited. And that's also reflected in the debate within China. Uh, it is one of those uh, topics where there is still a lot of divergence uh, between those uh, that are extremely bullish, and there are still a few that think um, you know, China can continue to grow at uh, 7% for the next uh, two decades or so. Uh, then there is a group that um, is uh, somewhat more uh, pessimistic, uh, uh, growth rates below 5% and significantly uh, below 5%. And then you have those in the middle, and um, uh, we'll talk about uh, Majun's in one second. Now, why is that in part? Because it's the methodologies that diff different authors use. Those who are very bullish usually think about growth convergence in line with other Asian economies. Uh, those that are a little bit more bearish are thinking about the average country in the world and are thinking about uh, mean conversion. And then there are some uh, that try to have China-specific uh, production functions. Now, what Ma Jun uh, has tried to do is to distill and focus on a few uh, structural variables to think about China's uh, long-term uh, growth outlook, um, focusing on demographics, uh, services, uh, environmental costs. These are all headwinds. And then he has one where he argues uh, this is the part that uh, can help us a lot. Now, selecting um, a general equilibrium model for this exercise has, of course, many advantages. Um, the Micro Foundation is, of course, one of them. Um, the fact that he is looking at two sectors uh, is very, very good. Uh, but those, uh, like ourselves, who have been working with uh, uh, general equilibrium mo models in the context of China, calibration is a major challenge and the assumptions that you are uh, m uh, making. Um, now, um, maybe already um, um, give you the headline, the results that uh, he produced um, by having a growth potential of about 5% uh, seem to be um, reasonable. Maybe just a few words about uh, the variables, uh, the structural parts that he's looking at. 
uh, apart from demographics, um, clearly uh, the service sector that has already uh, uh, changed China quite a bit. We're looking at about the share of services now being about 52 percent. Uh, if you compare that to advanced economies and some of the more advanced emerging markets, you're looking at a benchmark of about 70 to 80 percent. Um, I think Korea um, uh, um, has about 60 percent. So clearly there's a lot uh, to go. Um, environmental cost, he already highlighted those. Uh, again, just coming back to air pollution, there has been quite a bit of progress that has been made. But if you compare that to the black line, which is the international standard, um, there are still humongous uh, challenges. So these are the headwinds. And then he's focusing on a part, and I want to spend one second on that one, and that is the benefits of uh, SOE reform. Now, that's a very challenging exercise. Um, maybe just a few questions for you. How many uh, state-owned enterprises does China have? 167,000. Um, 50,000 or so are central. Uh, the rest of it are local uh, SOEs. I mention that uh, because when you have as many, uh, the political economy of reforming them, of course, uh, is a little bigger than if you just had uh, a few. Now, China has the largest SOE sector in the world, 200% uh, percent of, of GDP. But does it matter? Well, in terms of employment and value added, it has already um, come down quite a bit. Uh, the key is, and that's the point uh, that Majun is making, is productivity levels are less than 50% of that uh, in the private sector. And just for those who always care about risks, 50% of bank credit goes to a relatively small SOE sector. Now, one part that he hasn't focused on, but there's a debate right now in China, is you have these SOEs, and they are a drag on growth. They're also zombies. I think the term zombie was actually created in the academic literature in Japan. Uh, the number of zombie firms has gone up quite a bit. Uh, a part of the fact that they are increasing um, as a share, uh, they are particularly important because they contribute even a larger share to the indebtedness. Now you could say, well, if you look at SOEs and you're not really thinking about resolving zombies, then you're missing a large part of the equation. We looked at some micro data. The good news is, maybe for, from an analytical point of view, that there is a big overlap between zombie firms and SOEs. Not fully, but there is. So by SOE reform, you would have a significant positive impact. So maybe just uh, two or three words on um, you know, potential uh, caveats. I already pointed out, I think calibration is, uh, is critical. Um, in our exercise, which is not in the general equilibrium model, we try to uh, estimate what the benefits from SOE reform could be. We are of the view they could actually be larger than uh, implied in, in the model. Maybe it has to do uh, with the uh, uh, calibration, capital stock. Um, the other one is, and again, um, you know, if one were to think a little bit further, uh, whether it would be possible to sort of like um, a model, uh, have a more sectorial uh, analysis shifting from manufacturing to, to services. Um, maybe I, I was a little surprised about the impact of labor supply uh, in this model. The multiplier was relatively uh, large. Um, environmental costs, um, dealing with those can of course have an impact on inflation. And of course here, especially in the Chinese context, it will depend on the reaction function of the central bank. As you all know, uh, the central bank in China does not have one objective, it has multiple objectives. So uh, that would have to be uh, seen. Maybe one final word on policies. So I think collectively um, uh, there is strong agreement that one of the critical parts of structural reforms that could help um, uh, in a positive way to deal with some of the negative parts uh, coming from demographics, environment, uh, and potentially moving to the service sector from a productivity uh, point of, of view is, is of course uh, the willingness to accept a potentially lower uh, 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 growth number going forward. Uh, China to this day has a uh, implicit growth target at least by 2020 that is uh, uh, six, would imply about 6.4 percent going forward. Uh, we also know, and this is where the long and the short term 
uh, kind of do not always meet is that uh, doing SOE reform and dealing with zombie firms um, ultimately implies that in the short term there might be uh, some cost in terms of a slowdown uh, in, in, in growth. Now, we are of the view that China can, in line with the objectives that they still have, uh, reach their current growth targets. But as the figure on the right-hand side shows, the risk here is, of course, if one were to hang on for too long to a growth target that might be uh, somewhat ambitious, uh, debt levels would, of course, continue to rise. Uh, this figure here shows non-financial sector debt, so it's uh, public and private. Um, China, by far the largest increase as a percent of GDP over the last uh, couple of years by 100 percentage point. And based on our uh, assumption that the government, at least for some time, would continue uh, with its uh, uh, policies of trying to reach that target, if the reforms were not to be implemented, would imply that uh, debt levels would continue uh, to significantly uh, increase. So the other uh, point here on the left-hand side, the red line is like a baseline. We believe that the government can deliver, uh, potentially by not fiscally consolidating um, as quickly, uh, credit growth being potentially a little bit faster than warranted. And then what happens is that while we don't see a crisis, the, 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 the possibility for significant uh, variations is, is, of growth is quite large. In our view, uh, the point that Majun was uh, uh, highlighting, SOE reform, among others, but it's probably one of the most decisive reforms, uh, will be critical to ensure that China moves from the current growth model that still relies uh, heavily on credit and debt to one that is uh, more sustainable. Thank you very much. Thank you, Alfred, for the uh, very well uh, pointed the, uh, comment. Uh, to, to make our discussion uh, more interactive, uh, I will ask the, uh, Mr. Ma uh, to react to the, uh, some of the comments uh, made by uh, Alfred. So, Mr. Ma, please. Thank you. Um, just a few very brief reactions. Well, thank you very much, Alfred, for the uh, very insightful comments and discussions. The first thing is on SOU reform. I know you said uh, uh, the potential upside from SOU reform could be larger. Uh, I agree with you. Uh, we made some assumptions which are actually quite conservative. For example, in the next uh, 18 years, we assume the uh, declining SOE share is only by 10 percentage points. Uh, we can assume it's 30 percentage points, then a lot of upside potential because of productivity gain. Uh, that's based on what I feel as a sort of uh, the political reality. Uh, of course, if uh, the uh, willingness uh, to reform uh, strengthens, then this assumption can be changed. Um, and uh, the other point is uh, on the methodologies and so on. I, I fully take your, your comments. We need to work on uh, you know, various uh, assumptions and uh, uh, various methodologies for calibrating the models and so on so that we have enough transparency um, in, in the final paper and uh, the reader will know that uh, your number is coming from these assumptions. If you don't like it, you change it, and the results will change. Uh, my third point is on, on, on potential policies. I'm going to elaborate tomorrow as there's a policy section uh, where I will attend. But uh, other than SOE, uh, which could be a policy-driven upside to growth, I think another major area in China is the deregulation. Uh, we still have a lot of regulation um, you know, it's essentially barrier to entry into high growth service sectors, some such as education, health, uh, media, and so on and so forth. Now, these are areas where demand growth is actually very high, uh, but uh, <coughs> the uh, restrictions uh, for private sector, for foreign uh, investments uh, remain quite uh, extensive. And the uh, final point is on uh, to what extent we should emphasize the growth objective itself uh, has a subtle implication on uh, the policy choices. If you emphasize growth objective every single year, every quarter, then it tends to drive policy towards stimulus. Um, because the next quarter looks like growth is slowing down below target. Why don't we do more in terms of fiscal, monetary stimulus, and so on and so forth? Um, <clears throat> but if you can emphasize growth on a long-term basis, let's say we should really focus on growth-enhancing measures for five, ten years, uh, then the focus will be shifted 
towards uh, structural reforms, such as the difficult ones in the SOE and the deregulation area. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Ma. Uh, let me conclude the uh, China part. And the, uh, uh, I would like to correct the, uh, some question. Maybe I will, will do so after the, uh, uh, finishing the series of the discussion, uh, the presentation and discussion uh, whole through. So then, uh, uh, oh, first of all, anyway, uh, let's uh, give, their, uh, give a two of uh, uh, good dear speaker and the discussant a big hand, please. Now then move to the uh, India, uh, the, uh, our speaker, Ms. Uh, Dr. Uh, Mishra. Uh, we are, I've just recognized uh, the, uh, this is the uh, first session in this uh, conference uh, where we have the uh, female the, uh, speaker. So we are very proud of the, the, uh, in terms of uh, gender diversity and I wish the uh, Madame Lagarde uh, should be here <laughs> to appreciate us. So floor is yours. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Kaizuka, and thank you very much to the organizers uh, for having me here. Um, I'm absolutely delighted. This is my first time um, in Korea, and um, um, I should say I'm going to talk about India, as Mr. Kaizuka pointed out, despite being in the Western Hemisphere Department of the Fund. Uh, the background for this is um, I've worked only on India for the last uh, roughly four years, first with the government um, and then with the central bank. Um, so hopefully I'll be able to add something. Um, so I'm going to talk about uh, India's exports, uh, the new normal, and uh, this is a joint work um, with uh, Sajid Chinoy at JP Morgan and Siddharth Nath at uh, the Reserve Bank of India. Uh, let me say this is very preliminary, so we would really welcome uh, feedback uh, from our discussant and uh, the audience. Um, I have to put this up. Um, so let me start by uh, giving some um, uh, background. So while um, um, the financial integration of India is, is increasingly appreciated and uh, is also visible in terms of rising uh, capital flows, bo both inflows and outflows, and um, as well as increasing correlation of Indian asset prices with its global counterparts, uh, surprisingly, the integration on the real side is clearly um, underappreciated. So there are two pieces of um, conventional um, wisdom on India. Um, first, um, uh, that India is a relatively closed economy on the real front, um, with exports being really of marginal significance. And this, um, this has led to another line of thinking, which is that um, um, the second piece of conventional wisdom that India is um, uh, insulated from um, global shocks. Um, um, but to believe in conventional wisdom is like believing in old reality. So the, the goal of this paper is to turn around both uh, these pieces of um, conventional wisdom. Um, so let me start um, showing you um, how um, uh, the tradable sector in India has actually expanded at um, a very rapid pace. Um, uh, so trade as measured by exports uh, plus imports as a ratio of GDP has grown from about 27% uh, back in 2000 um, uh, to, more, to more than double um, uh, to 56% in um, 2012. Of course, um, uh, you know, we have been affected by uh, deglobalization. Um, um, however, the important part is that um, this um, integration has brought with it um, uh, supply chain efficiencies, has helped um, uh, productivity improvements and technology transfer, and there's, and, and there's micro-level evidence on India um, in, 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 in this context. But at, at the same time, um, this increased integration has um, also exposed us to um, uh, global growth uh, as well as protectionism shocks. Um, and I would say uh, more than is commonly believed. Um, so let's look uh, at, at, at the case of exports. So exports as a share, um, uh, so how, um, uh, how India, India is integrated um, in the global economy can be measured uh, by how exports um, are growing as a share of GDP and, and, and also uh, what is the elasticity of these exports uh, to global demand. 
um, um, so, so, so higher, higher is the share of exports in GDP and higher is the elasticity to global demand. More, uh, also more vulnerable is the economy to, um, uh, to external shocks. Um, so if you look at um, exports as a share of GDP, they've also increased from about 12% um, uh, um, um, in, in back in 2000 to, uh, to close to 22% um, uh, um, in 2013. Of course, um, if, um, you know, deglobalization blues have affected India, but it's um, actually quite similar to, uh, um, if you look uh, at, at, at the slowdown, it's very similar to an average uh, emerging economy. Um, however, despite um, the slowdown, um, exports are about 20% of GDP, so about, um, um, uh, you know, as, so India is at least as open as um, Indonesia is. Um, two facts um, complement uh, this increased openness. Um, one is um, the composition of exports, which I'm going to talk about in a little bit, has also changed uh, towards components that are more likely to be sensitive uh, to global demand. Um, and, 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 and the second, and, and the second uh, complementary uh, fact to this openness is that um, uh, the elasticity of exports with respect to global demand um, is high and significant, though it has come down um, in recent years. Um, um, so let me, um, you know, any analysis of the export sector in India has to contend with um, two revolutions that have characterized um, uh, exports, Indian exports. One is the more um, visible and much talked about revolution, which is in the services sector. Um, however, there's another revolution, albeit um, a quiet one on the manufacturing side. And let me talk uh, quickly about both, uh, both these. Um, uh, so if you look at uh, services, if you look at the visible and talked about revolution in India, um, um, we do find evidence for an increasing role of services. So back in 2003, uh, services comprised about 30% uh, uh, of um, the Indian export uh, basket. Just in a, um, in, a, in a time frame of four years, um, the share of services um, uh, jumped uh, uh, to about 35%. Um, um, uh, so basically, almost a four to five um, uh, percentage point. Um, um, it, 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 so a sharp increase in just um, um, a time frame of four years. And of course, this coincided with the global um, spurt in software and BPO from which um, India, in, India benefited a lot. That said, um, uh, since, um, uh, you know, uh, since then, um, the services sec the exports of services have more or less plateaued. Um, the second uh, revolution, as I said, the more quieter revolution and less talked about is what has happened in um, manufacturing. And here what we find is that there's a move uh, from uh, traditional towards uh, new age uh, manufacturing. Um, so if you look at textiles, uh, gems, and leather, um, these are the traditional Indian exports. Um, the share, uh, the total share um, uh, of, in their total share in the export uh, basket back in 2003 was uh, as large as 60%. Uh, since then, it has, it has secularly fallen, and now uh, the share of um, um, uh, uh, textiles, uh, gems, and gem, textiles, leather, and gem, uh, gems is about... Um, as low as 40%. And in contrast, if you see um, a sector like um, engineering, which comprises uh, capital goods and auto parts, um, it has is, it is grown at an impressive rate of about uh, 15% uh, per annum. Um, and, and, and its share has almost, almost doubled in the export basket from 20 to 35% um, of the overall basket. Um, and um, uh, so, so back in 2003, um, um, in, in, you know, the new age um, exports were, um, um, if you look at um, electro engineering, electronics, uh, chemical and pharmaceutical, um, uh, they, they comprised about 40% um, uh, of the export basket. Now they're as high as 60%. Uh, why is all this important? Um, you know, for two reasons. Uh, one is India seems to be uh, going up the value chain which, with more sophistication 
in exports. Um, you know, one can lament about it as well. Um, uh, that, you know, um, Indian exports are becoming more capital intensive and the need of the R is actually to, um, you know, create more jobs and seize uh, the demographic dividend. Um, um, uh, this, the, the second reason why this is interesting is um, that the sensitivity of exports to global demand actually varies by sectors. So some sectors react more to global demand than the, than, than the other sectors. So what we find, I'm not going to go over the details of the econometric analysis in the paper, but basically what we find is that um, export volumes are largely driven by uh, changes in partner country growth. Um, however, there's sectoral variation in elasticities, and some sectors actually respond more to global demand than do other sectors. And it, in fact, it is the new age exports um, uh, which exhibit higher um, income elasticity. So, so in a sense, there has been shift towards these new age exports, but, but at the same time, this shift also represents a move towards um, um, items which are more sensitive to global impulses. Um, so one, an, another finding in the paper is that um, the, the sensitivity to global demand is high um, and highest, as I said, for new age exports such as engineering, pharmaceutical and chemicals, but it has come down like um, in other countries. Um, one uh, one uh, finding which we are surprised by is that in the Indian case, uh, the structural break actually occurs way before the global financial crisis. So these elasticities have come down, but not, you know, the structural break is not, not, not the crisis, but back uh, in 2005. Um, another key finding from um, the econometric analysis, and this is actually uh, corroborated uh, by many earlier studies as well, um, in the Indian data, in the macro data at least, you find a very small um, and statistically ind indistinguishable, uh, indistinguishable um, effect, um, uh, effect of um, exchange rate movements on exports. So the estimated elasticities are very small and uh, statistically indistinguishable from zero. And this you know, leads us um, to ask the question, why, why is that the case? Um, um, so the two possible explanations, one is you know, methodological issues. It's very hard to identify these export exchange rate elasticities with macro data. Um, both exports and exchange rates are highly endogenous. And um, uh, so identification is very, very hard. Um, however, uh, the other explanation is more, you know, facts on the ground, um, that there could be reasons why, why in the aggregate data you don't see an effect. Um, so in order to um, uh, dig deeper, we look, uh, we, we, we look at firm level data from India. And um, um, basically what we find here is that um, elasticities, export exchange rate elasticities um, vary significantly across firms in different sectors. And what seems to matter is um, how much is uh, the imported intermediate input content of exports in different sectors. So for example, um, um, in, in sectors, um, for firms in sectors with high domestic value added or low imported in intermediate input um, content of exports, you actually see that um, uh, there is a correlation between exchange rate movements and exports. However, um, um, uh, it, it, for firms in sectors which are very high in foreign value added, um, you see less of an effect. The idea being that you know, um, in, in sectors which are um, more, um, for firms in sectors which are more imported intermediate input intensive, uh, an exchange rate depreciation, for example, also makes the imported imp inter intermediate inputs more expensive, so you don't get the kick um, uh, to competitiveness from uh, exchange rate movements. So let me show you uh, uh, this picture. This is, um, uh, let's take, uh, you know, firms in a sector with high domestic value added, for example, textiles. And um, here you do see that, um, um, you know, um, an, a, a strengthening of uh, the real effective exchange rate in the Indian context is associated with a declining um, a market share uh, of this sector. Um, however, if you look at a sector like uh, drugs and ph pharmaceuticals, which are very high, which are more um, uh, imported intermediate input um, intensive or more, uh, or um, uh, which have a high foreign value added content, you actually uh, do not see uh, that um, a strengthening of the real effective exchange rate of the rupees associated with uh, uh, declining exports. Um, 
Um, let me move to another point, which is that you know, the role of exports um, um, to ex um, has to be seen in the context of the recent slowdown in, uh, in growth, which India has, uh, has, has seen. Um, so if you look at, um, um, uh, so, the, so India's much celebrated 9% uh, growth actually came against the background of a surging export sector. Um, uh, for example, if you look at the period between 2003 and 2008, um, the GDP growth averaged about 8.8%. Export growth um, during this period was close to 18%. Private consumption growth, on the other hand, was only about 7.5%. Um, uh, what happened more recently? Export, go export growth has almost collapsed to about 2.5%, um, uh, and which is, uh, which is coincident with um, uh, a GDP growth uh, a de decline of about 200 basis points. Um, uh, private consumption growth has more or less been around the same, um, around the same level. The idea being that you know, um, um, the, the decline in growth has also coincided with a sharp decline um, in the growth rate of exports. Of course, there are issues um, uh, about, you know, India has revised its GDP series. Uh, so if you adjust for, um, uh, you know, the, uh, this, the statistical issues, basically what we find is that we can explain about, we can explain, exports slowdown can explain about two-thirds of uh, the decline in overall GDP growth. Um, so bottom line, um, uh, India has not explained the de has, has not escaped uh, the deglobalization blues. Um, if global growth uh, uh, remains sluggish in the new normal, then that will indeed imply tepid prospects for India's export growth as well as GDP growth. So what are the options going forward? Uh, do we reevaluate re India's growth potential? Do we look for new sources of growth, or uh, or is, is it the case that, uh, you know, even if the pie doesn't grow up, India can actually increase its, 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 its share in global exports? So even amidst the new normal, India can get um, an increasing share of the pie. However, the evidence here has not been that encouraging. So this uh, table just shows um, um, uh, uh, the share in world apparel exports. Uh, and it compares uh, China with some of the other Asian economies. So if you look at between 2000, since 2009, um, uh, Chinese share um, uh, in, 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 you know, uh, in world exports of apparel has declined by about four percentage points. Um, China is still the elephant in the room, but still there has been some decline. However, the, incre uh, the space vacated by China has, um, uh, has been occupied by countries like uh, Bangladesh, um, 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 Vietnam and, 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 and Cambodia. India, if you look at India, its share um, has almost been stagnant in the global market. So this leads us to two pertinent questions. Um, how can and how can India raise exports amidst the new normal? And if exports are less likely to power growth and investment, where will growth come from? And here, um, incidentally, the answer to both the questions rests on the same four pillars, infrastructure, human capital, regulation, and access to finance. So growth, um, um, you know, growth can come from um, increased public and private investment in infrastructure, where India stares a large deficit. Um, of course, um, any thrust to public investment will need um, a commensurate fiscal space, um, which is going to be a challenge given that India is also striving towards um, fiscal consolidation and debt sustainability. Um, asset sales remains um, a more viable option to create fiscal space uh, to raise uh, public investment. On private investment, um, um, the twin balance sheet problem of both banks and corporates um, needs to be addressed to spur private investment in human and physical uh, capital infrastructure. Um, so let me conclude by just saying that you know, India has benefited tremendously from um, integration on the real side. Um, but at the same time, uh, it has also exposed us to um, risks and vulnerabilities to global growth as well as protectionism shocks. So the sooner we um, um, understand and prepare, uh, prepare for it, uh, it will be better. So let me end the presentation. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Mishra.
a very interesting uh, presentation focusing on the, uh, one of the issues we are discussing, the uh, spillover. So uh, we have the uh, uh, discussant, uh, Mr. Ken Kang. So floor is yours. Okay, thank you, uh, Kazuaka-san. Um, let me start with some key takeaways from uh, Prachi's paper. But uh, given her nice presentation, I won't go into the details and just quickly mention what I took away as her, her main findings. I mean, overall, I thought the, the paper was an interesting one, you know, using macro-level evidence supported by sectoral and firm-level analysis to look at some of the key drivers of India's exports. On um, three main findings, um, India's exports have undergone a quiet revolution over the past two decades. Not only have exports expanded very rapidly, but also their composition has shifted markedly away from traditional items to new engineering, electronics, pharmaceuticals, and services. It's not too surprising that external demand is the main driver of India's exports, but the negligible role of the exchange rate and relative prices is somewhat uh, counterintuitive. The findings, uh, though, raise important implications uh, for spillovers for India's future growth if the weakness in the advanced economies persists. So let me focus my comments on examining how her findings fit in with other research, including those done by the IMF, and take a more forward look at what can be done to address this new mediocre risk for India's exports. First, on the role of trading partner demand. Now, we at the IMF have also done some recent analysis on export performance and find some similar results. Uh, for example, the fall 2016 World Economic Outlook uh, featured a chapter on sluggish world trade and found that weak investment accounted for about three quarters of the trade slowdown. Research by our India team using both macro and industry level data also find that export elasticities similar to Prachi's um, with trading partner demand being the main driver of exports. However, one difference is that while, like Prachi, we see a post-2005 decline in export elasticities, this decline brings the elasticities closer to their long-run average of around one, and that much of the decline comes in the electronics sector. Turning to the role of exchange rates, uh, her findings that the exchange rate changes at the margin do not affect exports is somewhat surprising though she does find that appreciation hurts exporters of higher domestic value added sectors, suggesting that the global supply chain may play a factor here. Nevertheless, other studies, including those by the IMF, find that prices do matter, with elasticities of around minus two to minus, sorry, minus 0.2 to minus 0.3, similar to those in, uh, in the literature. The weak link, though, between the exchange rate and exports, however, do suggest that relative price signals uh, in India may be somewhat distorted and are not allocating efficiently resources or supporting firm growth. So let me build a bit on this idea and examine what policies in an environment of weak growth in the advanced economies can help make India's exports more competitive and responsive to the changing patterns of external demand. The first policy is an obvious one, is to reduce further trade distortions. And as you can see here in the left uh, chart, India, oh, sorry, emerging markets and developing economies have made significant progress in reducing average tariff rates over the past 35 years. India as well has made significant progress, as you can see in the right chart, lowering its applied tariff rates from around 37% in 2000 to under 15% in 2015. Nevertheless, India's import tariffs are among the highest among emerging markets and above those in Asia, especially China, against whom India is competing. Therefore, there is room to reduce further tariff and non-tariff barriers, especially in the sectors of food, agriculture, and manufacturing. Second, there is scope to integrate more into global value chains. In the left chart, you can see that the value of India's uh, intermediate goods exports, the, uh, the middle blue bar, has increased steadily, but since around 2010 has largely plateaued. Uh, 
This can also be seen in India's share of foreign value added in merchandising exports. It's the orange line in the right chart, which has also leveled off at about uh, 25%. Similar to the trend in other countries, but still below those of China and Indonesia in the region. Further integration into global value chains would not only boost demand for India's exports, but also expand access to technology and capital and improve the business environment. At the same time, given India's large economic size and 1.2 billion people, there is significant scope to strengthen domestic supply linkages. In this regard, the recent rollout of the nationwide goods and services tax in July, which will apply a single uniform indirect tax on the supply of goods and services across India's 29 states and seven union territories, represents an important step forward in promoting national integration and enhancing export competitiveness. This could have important economic implications given the size of India's states. For example, the most populous state, Uttar Pradesh, if it were a separate country, would be the fifth largest in the world by population, just after Brazil. And we and others have tried to estimate the potential growth benefits of the goods and services tax for reducing trade barriers across states and find them to be quite substantial. For example, we estimate that the growth potential could rise by as much as 0.5 to 1 percentage points to be above over 8% uh, over the medium term. Another important policy priority is to protect India's price competitiveness. As you can see in the left chart, India's nominal effective exchange rate has steadily declined since the global financial crisis, especially against Indonesia and China. However, once you factor in relative price changes, you can see in the right chart that in real effective terms, India's exchange rate has actually appreciated by over 20% since 2008, closing the gap with China and other emerging markets. This is due to India's higher average inflation rate compared to its partner countries, highlighting the need to maintain a market-determined exchange rate, keep inflation pressures under control, and to pursue reforms to enhance export competitiveness. Finally, there is a need to address the legacy of the credit bubble of the mid-2000s in the corporate and banking sectors. If you look at the left chart, you can see that the close correlation between credit growth and real investment, both in the run-up and the subsequent decline. It's interesting, but perhaps not coincidental, that the post-2005 decline in export elasticities estimated by Prachi coincides with the peak of the credit bubble and investment boom. Non-financial corporate debt in India is relatively low at around 50% of GDP, compared to the EM average of around 90%. But as seen in the right chart, the official level of non-performing loans and restructured loans for all banks is quite high at 12%, significantly higher for public banks and still rising. However, estimates by the IMF and others of the distressed debt as a share of, of debt that with an interest coverage ratio of below one are much higher, accounting for about a fifth of total corporate debt. High corporate leverage and non-performing loans may be an obstacle to efficient resource allocation, preventing both the exit of non-viable firms, uh, the growth of productive firms, as well as the entry of new firms. And this is supported by firm level analysis, which finds evidence of significant misallocation. Sui and Klenau use micro level data and find that uh, large capital and labor misallocations compared to the US, and that removing these distortions could raise TFP by as much as 40 to 60%. We also have some research coming from the IMF looking at misallocation across <clears throat> India states and find that it varies quite substantially and that credit availability is one important driver of resource misallocation, suggesting that removing key structural rigidities in the input market and improving credit allocation across firms would help reduce distortions and contribute to productivity gains. So let me end here where I began by highlighting India as an interesting case study of a large and somewhat open economy with a young and growing workforce subject to spillovers from stagnation elsewhere, particularly through trade and investment. Now, India has made tremendous progress in the pace and breadth of reforms in recent years, and in particular, the, the goods and services tax represents a huge step forward in promoting national integration 
uh, as well as um, external um, um, integration. So I think we broadly agree with Prachi's findings and recommendations for India to address the remaining structural rigidities that are holding back India's export potential. I mean, here the priority should be on getting the prices right to reallocate resources more efficiently, deepen India's integration with global value chains, and address the supply constraints and its large infrastructure needs. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ken. Here, following the uh, previous uh, the, the, uh, set of the discussion, I will ask the, uh, uh, Dr. Isha to respond very, very briefly. Maybe you have uh, one minute to respond. Thank you very much, Ken. It's an extremely insightful uh, discussion. I think uh, you added a lot. Uh, you know, I focused on the export sector, but you gave a much broader overview, you know, addressing problems like misallocation, um, you know, banking sector issues. Um, so thank you very much. I think just a quick thing, um, you raised the point on why the exchange rate effects are small. Uh, this is a puzzle for us, but, uh, you know, other studies have also found, uh, on India have also found uh, uh, similar results. As I said um, in the presentation, it could be both methodological issues, like it's hard to identify these effects with macro data, or it could be facts um, on the ground. One of the facts on the ground, as I said, is, um, you know, firms in different sectors react differently. Um, but also, you know, a lot of the um, exports are actually invoiced in U.S. dollars. Um, which implies that, you know, um, the kick to competitiveness is likely to be small because prices don't change. Um, um, with this, let me end and thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, both of you. And uh, please uh, give a uh, crowd to both of them. Thank you. And our last set of the um, uh, discussion on Indonesia. Um, actually, I got the instruction from the uh, conference organizer that we have to start the dinner 6.30 sharp. So it is the, uh, uh, the, the very important to keep the uh, uh, allocated time, 20 minutes for the uh, this, uh, presentation and 10 minutes for the discussion. So floor is yours. Yes. Okay, thank you very much, and thank you to um, the Ministry of Strategy and Finance, the Bank of Korea, uh, the Peterson Institute, and my colleagues at the IMF for, for, for all the organization and logistic uh, work for this conference. So this is the last of the case studies that will analyze the implications of secular stagnation or the new mediocre, and it'll focus on Indonesia. So I'll begin first by telling you or what it is that's different about Indonesia, what's unique that warrants a different case study. Uh, I'll then turn to the second component of the talk in which I look retrospectively at the evolving role of global versus domestic factors in Indonesia's growth dynamics over about a 15 year period since the Asian financial crisis. I'll first describe the evolution of Indonesia's linkages with the global economy, and then assess whether the changing nature of these linkages has affected the transmission of secular stagnation to, to its domestic economy. In the third part, I'll look ahead at how Indonesia's potential growth is forecast to evolve under the new mediocre, and consider an illustrative scenario in where changes in Indonesia's integration with the global economy can affect the future path of potential in output. So the first question of what it is that makes Indonesia a, a study worth doing. We'll, we know from Olivier's talk this morning and from some of the other literature that out, that's out there that the transmission of secular stagnation to a growth in emerging markets will depend on the nature of the shock and the strength of linkages. The two most relevant linkages are clearly trade and financial. Uh, a slowdown in advanced economies can weaken the terms of trade. It's also likely to lower external demand, so if the external sector is sizable in the domestic economy, both channels can induce a slowdown in domestic growth rates. 
financial linkages will also matter. The stock of external liabilities can induce balance sheet effects. Uh, slowdown in external demand will potentially depreciate the nominal exchange rate and restrain demand by raising debt. And by restraining demand, it will have implications for, for lowering growth. Self-fulfilling prophecies can also play a role if financial markets anticipate that emerging markets will not be able to escape the effects of secular stagnation and uh, by affecting their growth rates and their debt repayment capacity will lead financial markets to raise the risk premium. And finally, if secular stagnation is the result of decelerating productivity in advanced economies, a hypothesis that's most forcefully put forward by, by, by Gordon, then the growth spillovers into emerging markets can also come from lowering the diffusion of technology. So as Olivier mentioned this morning, the evidence doesn't, doesn't seem to be then. I too will not be focusing on that particular channel. So given the centrality of these linkages in transmitting secular stagnation from advanced economies to emerging markets, Indonesia presents itself as a very unique case study. As I'll describe in the next set of the slides, in the years since the Asian financial crisis, Indonesia has steadily retrenched from the global economy, both in terms of trade and financial integration. This reflects a, a very complex combination of factors, including its uh, fundamentals, um, the institutions, uh, policies, and uh, the rising momentum of inward-looking populist parties. At the same time, in spite of, or perhaps as a result of, its rising insularity, Indonesia has very successfully engineered extremely high rates of growth which have also been very stable over a fairly long period of time. These growth rates don't appear to be much synchronized with the global economy. And in fact, Indonesia was in a small minority of countries that experienced only a very mild slowdown during the global financial crisis. So these basic facts lead me to ask the two, two main questions of this presentation, which is what has been the growth implication of Indonesia's rising insularity? Has it limited the transmission of secular stagnation from advanced economies? And what have been the costs of its rising ins insularity? Does weakening integration with the global economy lie behind the successive markdowns of its potential growth rate? So let me start by establishing some of the stylized facts um, about Indonesia's changing integration with the global economy. Starting with trade, on the left side panel, we have the evolution of exports and imports, both in ratio to GDP. And as you can see, they have both trended down uh, fairly steadily over the last 15 years. Exports um, are declining even in the period from 2000 to the global financial crisis, a period in which there was a significant run up in commodity prices, which one may have expected would have led to higher exports um, for a commodity exporter like uh, Indonesia. The decline of these ratios is not just a reflection of the expansion of the economy, a denominator effect, because as you can see on the right-hand side where I show the growth rates of exports and imports themselves, they have also been trending downwards and as of last year were finally negative. To put this in cross-country perspective, um, I show over here the average openness of Indonesia. So this is average over the last uh, 15 years, and it's uh, openness measured as usual, the exports plus imports over GDP. And I, I'm struck by how different Indonesia's experience has been relative to India's. As uh, Prachi had shown um, in, in her presentation, Indonesia has been on this declining trend, and among emerging market peers, lies as one of the most closed uh, economies. This group includes the BRICS as well as the, as the regional peers in ASEAN. So what's interesting to con consider is whether the declining trade exposure for, for Indonesia reflects any diversity across 
the, its various trading partners. And that's what this figure here attempts to do. What it shows is the shares of different regions in Indonesia's exports and imports. Uh, export shares on the left-hand side, imports on the right, and advanced economies in both panels shown in red. It's, it's clear that Indonesia's declining trade integration has, reflects almost fully its declining trade with advanced economies whose shares have been absorbed by other emerging markets, especially those, those in Asia. And this is a relevant factor to note because if there is to be a trade-based transmission of secular slowdown from advanced economies, the declining exposure to advanced economies suggests that this channel is not going to play much of a role. And reflecting the declining overall trade integration, we, we see that the contribution of, of the external sector to domestic growth dynamics have been small and have essentially dwindled to close to zero recently. Turning next to financial linkages with the global economy, measured here as the sum of external assets plus liabilities in ratio to GDP. What is striking is the period from 2000 till, uh, about the decade from 2000 till about 2010 a period in which there was a dramatic explosion of financial integration in countries across the world, including in Asia and especially among all of the ASEAN peers of Indonesia. In um, Indonesia, you can see buck this trend with uh, integration falling to just about 60% of GDP in uh, 2008. It has reversed course in the last several years after the global financial crisis, but even now it's only approached the level it was, that it was last at in 2002. And it's, it's worthwhile going into the breakdown of this. When you look into the breakdown of assets and liabilities, it's interesting that there's really just one asset class, one factor that lies behind uh, the declining financial integration and that's cross-border lending to Indonesian banks and corporates. One might speculate that you know, this reflects um, increasing financial intermediation capacity in Indonesia, but it was not actually accompanied by much financial deepening at all. In fact, it was the result of a very strict oversight on uh, foreign exchange borrowing um, you know, lessons, hard lessons learned from the Asian financial crisis to address the corporate governance problems that turned out to be so damaging uh, during, during that crisis. Again, to put this into a cross-country perspective and get a sense of just how much of an outlier Indonesia is in its declining integration, financial integration, what, we, what I show here is um, in, in blue, the 2015 level of financial integration, and in orange, the average level for the last 16 years or so. And again, you can see that uh, other than Argentina, which is insular for other reasons, Indonesia lies at the tail end of this, of this um, chart. So at the same time that Indonesia began its retrenchment from uh, financial integration, it also began to lower the, the external liabilities that were issued in foreign currency. Many of you might know that this is not unique to Indonesia. Anyhow, as I mentioned earlier, this suggests that balance sheet effects from a depreciation, say due to lower external demand, will be lower and also limit the transmission of secular stagnation. And before I proceed, uh, I, I want to say this is not the subject of my presentation, but it's I want to just briefly touch upon what lies behind Indonesia's retreat from the global economy. And uh, there are many, many factors. One is its, um, its fundamentals. It has a very large domestic base, which it has been able to tap to maintain growth without relying on, an ex without relying on the external sector. There are also institutions, the lack of sufficient regulations, resolutions that um, have impeded investment especially in exports and commodity sectors. Geography, some say, plays, has played a role. Its geographic isolation has limited its participation to a great degree, 
from the Asian supply chain. And then also the lessons it learns from the, from the two crises. Um, from the Asian financial crisis, my discussant, um, Mr. Chatri, has written about this, of the deep mistrust of foreigners and some international financial institutions as well. Uh, there have been high restrictions on foreign direct investment and in some sectors outright bans. Uh, the global financial crisis taught another lesson. Indonesia escaped from this crisis so well that it reinforced the domestic buy-in of a growth strategy de that depended on, on, on domestic inward-looking um, uh, uh, factors. And finally, there's the rising momentum of populist parties that, have, that, ha that are very um, inward-looking. The question that we want to ask is, of course, regardless of what its sources, what has been the growth implications of this rising insularity? And so what you have here is, on the left-hand side, is the real GDP growth rate of Indonesia, shown in black, and those of its ASEAN partners, shown in the dashed lines. Over a fairly, fairly long period, Indonesia has managed an average growth rate of about 5.5%. Um, what I find really striking about this is that it has, it covers an extremely um, long period of, of time in which there have been profound changes in the global economy, including the rise of China, a steep commodity price increase, a subsequent commodity price bust, a global financial crisis, and yet Indonesia seems to have stabilized its output within a small, within small bands. And you see the resulting volatility shown in the right-hand side, Indonesia is on the tail end. This is not just an, a, a relative statement, but an, a statement about its absolute volatility, which is extremely, extremely low. And growth rates don't appear to be much synchronized with the global economy, proxied here by the US growth rate. There was outright decoupling before the financial crisis. Since then, they are much more correlated, although it's not clear whether this is just a response to common global shocks. So I, to look at this a little bit more systematically, uh, I did a v do a VAR analysis in the chapter which looks at the decomposition of real GDP growth rates into domestic factors that include terms of trade, GBOR, the policy rate, inflation, um, and global factors, the, the global growth proxied by US real, real GDP growth, also China's growth, um, the MB spread for financing constraints, and the one-year bond rate. Uh, what the results of the analysis are sort of depicted graphically over here. The contribution of global factors is shown in orange, that of domestic factors in blue. What we see here is that really only during the global financial crisis is the role of global factors, the, the parts in orange, the clearly the main driver of GDP growth deviations for Indonesia. Thereafter, in the period that broadly is coincidental with secular stagnation in, in advanced economies, um, global factors have been negative for output dynamics, which is consistent with the transmission of secular stagnation into its economy, but the drag from these factors is actually very low is uh, small. Of course, the more ideal exercise would be to analyze what would have been the growth impact if Indonesia's linkages with the global economy were strong and rising, a counterfactual that we, we cannot study. Nevertheless, a qualified conclusion of this, of this, of this exercise is that the impact of st secular stagnation is negative for, the, for growth, but its impact is still fairly low. So at this point, we have an economy that's retreated tr by in trade and financial integration from the global economy that's maintained high growth rates with low volatility. And lest anyone think this is an endorsement of um, insularity, I turn to the third part of the analysis where I ask what costs have its rising insularity exacted on its potential growth rate. Um, and it begins with this with this slide which shows that the potential output growth rate has drifted lower in Indonesia and is projected to fall further over the medium term. As many people have mentioned uh, today, this is not specific to Indonesia. It's widely observed. 
And in fact, it, it must be said that the drift down is actually, in comparison, fairly small. But because it's well known that the pool of labor is, is large in Indonesia, I show here on the left-hand side, the labor force participation rate is reasonably high, it's stable, and capital accumulation shown on the right-hand side is also high, even in comparison to other ASEAN economies. It must be coming from a decline in the growth rate of TFP. And indeed, when you do a decomposition um, of potential growth rates, you see that the contribution of factors, factor accumulation has actually risen, but it's the drag from the decline in TFP and growth has been so large that it has offset that to lower the potential uh, output growth rate. And of course, insularity may well have played a role here. It will not be the only factor, but we know the well-known externalities by which integration uh, trade integration and financial integration can lead to more uh, allocative efficiency, better access to inputs, certainly the diffusion of technology, know-how, best practices, and the like, which are both productivity enhancing and growth raising. And uh, I'll quickly go over some of the evidence we have, which suggests that you know, some of these factors may in fact have played a role in lowering TFP growth since the global financial crisis. There's been a rise in protectionism, my discussant has actually written a little bit about this as well. There's rise in tariffs and non-tariff barriers, increase in the number of imports that are subject to tariffs. There's some weakening in institutions. It's, this could be for a number of reasons, but it could well be also because of the increase in protectionism, because best practices is something that is diffused through integration. Uh, there's a decline in human capital investment on top of a very low base to start with. Uh, shown on the left is the growth rate of higher education, and shown on the right panel is the percent of the population that has some tertiary ed that has completed tertiary education. For those of you who, who know these numbers, this is this is very low. This is ex extremely um, an extremely low base. So, in the final part of this uh, in this chapter, um, it's a, I do an illustrative study to get some just rules of thumbs about you know, how to think about these issues. Fortunately, many of the policies that the government, the authorities, and the international financial institutions have in mind for Indonesia to raise its potential growth rate will actually be TFP enhancing as well. These include the improvement in the business climate, um, limiting regu regulatory red tape, improving the quality of education, uh, pursuing trade integration, and, and many, many of these policies are independently important for you know, enhancing the, the quality of life, the standard of living, but they will also raise the potential output growth rate over time. Uh, running out of time, I'll, I'll just tell you briefly that I consider this analysis by mainly checking whether the implementation of such policies will lead to a TFP growth rate uh, equal to its pre-crisis rate. And lo and behold, you find that um, you know, raising the TFP growth rate will, of course, you know, given that it factors are being accumulated at a, at a strong rate, will raise uh, Indonesia's potential output growth rate um, back to its rising trend. And so to conclude, I, I, I'll just say a couple things. Why Indonesia? Well, I think it presents a very unique case. It's really quite different from the cases that we saw before. It's a country that has shown extreme, an extremely inward-looking stance, but it has successfully deflected the, the, the costs, the well-known costs of such rising insularity with maintaining high and stable growth rates. Uh, low linkages may have helped it in this respect, but the benefits of this rising in insularity mask a much higher cost about what it implies for the future, and that's its potential output growth rate. And um, like I said, the policies that raise TFP growth are already among those policies advocated by the authorities themselves, and uh, the IMF, for example, 
and these include greater global integration. By in introducing those policies, Indonesia will be able to regain access to, um, to, 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 to reinstate integration with the global economy and raise its potential output growth rate. And that's all I have. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Das. Now the, um, the last uh, discussion, uh, Mr. Basuri. You have 10 minutes. Thank you very much, uh, Kaizuka-san. Uh, we are gloriously behind time, so I'll be very brief. Um, first, I think, let me try to summarize the uh, findings. Um, her presentation is slightly different with her paper because maybe her paper was is still in the, in the draft when uh, she sent the paper uh, to us. Uh, basically, her point is Indonesia is relatively less integrated to the global economy, but because this, uh, we are less integrated, we have a less exposure, and then somehow it helped us during the global financial crisis, and also the impact of this possibility of the secular stagnation to Indonesia is, will be relatively low. Uh, but there is a risk of it, because by not being integrated to the global economy, there is a risk that uh, our economic growth will remain stagnant, so there is an important to emphasize about the role uh, of the foreign investment to be integrated in the global economy. So I think this is a very good paper, a very informative and has many important policies implication. And I would say that I very much agree on the findings, but I just uh, need to give a, a few comments. The first one is, the question is whether is it the openness will determine the growth or not. If you look at from this chart, it somehow shows that the domestic demand, um, a certain domestic demand uh, will help some economies during the, for example, like global financial crisis. But I think it is very interesting when I look at uh, uh, her paper, uh, she pointed out that, you know, in terms of this uh, average openness, Indonesia is uh, among the least open example of emerging market peers. But the question is, if you look at Brazil, even during the global financial crisis, the, uh, Brazil, in, in her presentation, is the least open countries. But if you look at during the global financial crisis, Brazil experienced a negative growth minus 0 0.2. And if you look at Argentina, Argentina is even more closer than Indonesia. But in terms of growth during the global financial crisis, they grew minus 6%. So we cannot really uh, tell that the growth, whether the country will be insulated, it depends on the openness or not. But I think the explanation is, has to do with the export direction of the countries. One of the reasons why Indonesia survived during the global financial crisis, I call it as a good luck and a good policy, because thanks to China and India. Because if you look at from these charts, it shows that because, uh, the China economy was relatively doing well, and also Indian economy at that time, it helped us because 60% of our export is energy and commodity related. So because of that, if you look at on the volume side, yeah, uh, despite our export decline in terms of value, but in terms of volume increase quite substantially. And most of our export are basically coal and palm oil, which is exported to China and exported to India. So I think the, the answer is, it's not depend on the, uh, the openness, but it really depends on the direction of the country. So that's explained uh, on uh, her chart regarding this, you know, the declining role of the um, advanced economy as the destination of Indonesian export. And the reason behind it is because our export shift into emerging Asia. But don't forget behind it, if you're talking about emerging Asia, basically most Asia export went into China. So we got a double sort of impact from China. The first one is China is one of our lar largest uh, trading partner. The second one, ASEAN, most of the ASEAN export is also is going to China. So China will play a major role on this, on this issue. Um, I'm gonna skip this. So the question is, it's probably not about the openness. Yeah, because if you look at Vietnam, Philippines, and maybe India, 
they are doing relatively well, even though their economy is relatively open. Yeah. So maybe uh, one of the reasons be behind this insulation yeah, um, is not only a matter of that you know, some policies become being protective or not, but I think one of the reasons behind it is because Indonesia somehow suffered from the Dutch disease. During the 2002 to 2012, 2013, because the commodity boom, we suffered from the Dutch, Dutch disease. I'll, I'll, I'll show it later on. Yeah? And if you look at from the growth of the manufacturing export, for example, from 2002 to 2016, Vietnam, in terms of growth, is about 1,631. Indonesia is only 136%. Uh, yeah? If you look at India, 500, Kenya, so Indonesia is one of the least. And one of the reason behind it, I may have different view when uh, Mitali does mention about the uh, issue of this becoming inward looking, yeah, which is true, but the reason behind it is because commodity boom, commodity super cycle. We suffered from the Dutch disease, so as a result, the exchange rate appreciation killed the manufacturing industry, and don't forget about the political economy. Bad times makes good policy, good times makes bad policy. So during the, during the good time, because we had a commodity boom, a lot of protectionist pressure come to the government to impose trade protection. Yeah, so, so I think the commodity story will play an important role. But I completely agree with uh, Mitali. If you look at from the variance decomposition, if you look at the co-movement between the private consumption and uh, components, it shows that it is export who contributed to the GDP growth. It's not the government consumption, and even gross fixed capital formation is relatively low. So the conclusion of it is Indonesia cannot afford to be a closed economy. But the problem is there is a risk. If we become an open economy, we are risk ourselves to sort of like the global volatility. Then let me talk about the policy implication. Yeah. Um, what Indonesia should do in order to minimize uh, the risk of being, you know, our export being uh, volatile uh, because our exposure to the global economy. If you look at from this chart, it is very interesting that the main answer to this is export diversification. Both in terms of this, because most of our product, if you look at this, highly concentrated on the primary uh, products because the exchange rate appreciation. But if we could diverse, uh, do the diversification of our, our export, based on the country destination and also the export product, it will help us. And it shows from this, you know, uh, correlations that if we move our export into the medium and high-tech manufacturing and not resource-based, somehow will help us. But the problem is, it's not easy for us to move into that direction. Why? Because Mitali does mention about the issue of the human capital. If you look at this issue of human capital, I use the PISA score, Unfortunately, I have to say that in terms of PISA score, Indonesia is a country maybe number three from the bottom in terms of ability of math and science. So that is why uh, the government, um, the MOF, a couple of years ago introduced the endowment fund allocated to the government bonds. Um, we spent about two billion US dollar money. Uh, so the return from this uh, endowment fund is being used for scholarship so any Indonesian get accepted in the top 200 universities in the world, they are eligible for this, and they don't need to work for the government because we need to address this issue. But the question is, it will take one generation to improve the quality of human capital. In the short term, the only way, the only solution is by attracting the foreign investment to come to Indonesia. Without that, I completely agree with Mitali Das, it's very difficult for us to achieve uh, economic growth more than 5%. Look at this. Indonesia could do more in promoting new export, but based on the calculation that uh, I did with my uh, colleague Raharja, I did the extensive and intensive margin. It shows that if you're talking about discovery, it's almost zero. Our export was basically you know, based on the intensive margin, the same export, the same product to the existing market. So if we want to improve um, you know, the, the performance, then definitely we need to be open to the foreign capital. I think I'll stop it here. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Basuri, for your keeping your, your time. And the, uh, let me give uh, just uh, one minute
uh, to uh, Mitali to respond to the comment made by the uh, students. Thank you, thank you, Mr. Bassi, for your comments. Um, it's very hard to challenge a former finance minister. Um, <laughs> I, I agree with everything you said. I, uh, I would add that uh, I, I also agree that uh, openness to trade is, is, not the, is not the only factor that has played a role. And in, especially when you, um, you know, raise, the, raise Brazil as a counterexample, I recall in a separate study that uh, Brazil actually was affected a large, in large measure by its financial linkages, which have a very different composition from, from Indonesia's. And um, I like very much the, the, the granularity you brought to, to, to your analysis um, about the Dutch disease and um, the, the, the intensive margin for export. Thank you very much. Thank you, both of you, and uh, please uh, give a big round to uh, uh, to uh, presenter and discuss them. Thank you. That was a very so lively discussion session. So uh, oh. please give them another round of big applause. That. Okay. Can I can I can I have a, just a, one concrete remark? Oh, okay, okay. Okay. I, I thought you were done. So Sorry. This <laughs> I'm not prolonging the uh, discussion, but uh, this concludes uh, our session, which is uh, quite interesting. We have uh, s uh, seen a very commonality and the difference of the uh, uh, situation and the policy reactions. This is the uh, kind of a good prelude for the uh, tomorrow's uh, discussion at the end of the uh, uh, seminar, uh, which consists of the, uh, all the three countries uh, at the panel. Uh, they are going to deepen the, the uh, policy dimension of the uh, issues uh, tomorrow. And uh, so, uh, anyway, uh, let, let me conclude here uh, in time for the uh, dinner. And uh, uh, finally, uh, let's give the uh, big applause again to, to, uh, to, to all the participants. Thank you. Thank you.